Good morning, and welcome to the Iridium Communications third quarter earnings conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. To withdraw from the question queue, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Ken Levy, Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thanks, Kate. Good morning and welcome to Iridium's third quarter 2022 earnings call. Joining me on this morning's call are our CEO, Matt Desch, and our CFO, Tom Fitzpatrick. Today's call will begin with a discussion of our third quarter results, followed by Q&A. I trust you've had an opportunity to review this morning's earnings release, which is available on the Investor Relations section of Iridium's website. Before I turn things over to Matt, I'd like to caution all participants that our call may contain forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Forward-looking statements are statements that are not historical fact and include statements about our future expectations, plans, and prospects. Such forward-looking statements are based upon our current beliefs and expectations and are subject to risks which could cause actual results to differ from forward-looking statements. Such risks are more fully discussed in our filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, our remarks today should be considered in light of such risks. Any forward-looking statements represent our views only as of today, and while we may elect to update forward-looking statements at some point in the future, we specifically disclaim any obligation to do so, even if our views or expectations change. During the call, we'll also be referring to certain non-GAAP financial measures, including operational EBITDA, pro forma free cash flow, free cash flow yield, and free cash flow conversion. These non-GAAP financial measures are not prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Please refer to today's earnings release and the Investor Relations section of our website for further explanation of non-GAAP financial measures and a reconciliation of the most directly comparable GAAP measures. With that, let me turn things over to Matt. Thanks, Ken, and good morning, all. Well, as you saw in this morning's release, we put up another quarter of very robust growth. Commercial revenue was up 10%, and we also showed strong trends in equipment sales and engineering services. You know, we feel really good about the momentum we've continued to see this year and the ongoing demand for our services. It certainly shows a clear appreciation in the market for the unique attributes of our network. In light of these trends, we're taking up our 2022 outlook for service revenue growth to between 8 and 9%. And now expect operational EBITDA of approximately $420 million this year, which would be up 11% from last year. By any measure, this has been a very strong year of growth. You know, the satellite industry overall has been a hot sector in recent years, though investor sentiment has tapered in recent months. A tremendous amount of capital poured into space-oriented companies over the past few years, though often not enough for most of them to complete their networks or technology. Many of these companies are likely finding the current investment environment to be particularly challenging. With a few exceptions, like SpaceX and Amazon, rising interest rates and investor uncertainty are materially changing the flow of capital our sector had enjoyed in recent years. Iridium is fortunate to have our network upgrades behind us and now be in an extended capital holiday phase during this broader market slowdown. With the industry in this new, more challenging environment, we are seeing some new strategic relationships emerge to weather the capital slowdown that many of us expect will endure for at least the next few years. In this environment, Iridium is very well situated and considering how best to take advantage of our unique position, perhaps in partnerships with some of these companies. For example, we continue to evaluate the narrowband IoT area as we think those types of network could be very complementary to our current leadership position in satellite IoT and only a few of the many announced networks are likely to survive the current investment climate. Personally, I think the cooling investment trend is probably good for the industry over the long term. Eventual shakeouts will rationalize competition and present some consolidation opportunities for healthy growing companies like Iridium. We continue to monitor activity, though there's nothing specific we'd share right now. I think our stock's performance in the market this year has been a function of investors' recognition of our unique combination of strong cash flow production and growth, as well as our continued potential for growth going forward, even in this environment. We're very happy with our position in the industry, and in particular, our location in the L-band. We've differentiated ourselves from other satellite companies through our history of high growth and consistently delivering on our promises. 
Staying in our lane and not straying from our strengths has been a winning strategy. We are executing well, comfortable with our focus on reliable connectivity and mobile applications, and are very optimistic about our continued opportunities for long-term growth using our existing L-band spectrum and constellation. We expect that the next 9 to 12 months will be especially impactful. We anticipate some new product launches and new partnerships, especially in IoT and personal communications. As Tom will discuss, we also expect Iridium's free cash flow to remain strong as we grow revenue and OEBITDA. Our balance sheet will continue to strengthen, and we are committed to rewarding our shareholders, even in an environment now characterized by higher interest rates. Now, getting back to our current results, into the third quarter, our voice and data business continue to be particularly strong, with subscriber growth up 8% from last year and revenue up double digits. We remain very optimistic on the outlook in this core business over the next few years, as demand for these services goes beyond first responders and public safety and reflects the adoption of newer service offerings like push-to-talk and satellite Wi-Fi for smartphones, which have come of age since their introduction more than five years ago. In our IoT business, Arim has been thoughtful and deliberate to steer into new industries and areas like heavy equipment, clean energy, autonomous vehicles, and personal safety messaging. We have also developed new products with our partners that make our services more accessible for business and commercial applications and even recreational personal users. By the way, I'm not referring to smartphone connectivity, for which our plans will become clear in due time. The whole direct connection to smartphone area is just additive to our already strong position in IoT and the areas we already play in for personal co connectivity of all types. Even with all the news and activity recently from other industry players to connect people directly from space, we think we are particularly well positioned to address this growth segment in a number of ways. We continue to see strong demand across the board for our IoT services. This is part of what's been driving strong demand for our equipment, modules, chipsets, and finished Iridium Edge devices, even as we continue to navigate supply chain challenges over the last year. We remain on pace for a record year in overall equipment sales and shipments. Today, Iridium's IoT services are quite diverse. We're being embedded by industrial, commercial, and government partners in more geographies and applications than ever before. They provide critical real-time data about operating conditions, asset position, and equipment health, allowing for control and remote access to resources in the field, which results in better decision-making and greater efficiency for their subscribers. IoT solutions powered by Iridium touch every facet of our existence. They control wind turbines, divert pipeline flows, and route electricity to minimize transmission losses. They also facilitate crop irrigation, monitor water levels for municipalities, and allow for better agricultural yields. Our network's ability to deliver real-time monitoring generates more uptime for heavy equipment and better tracking of fixed and moving physical assets. It also serves as a critical lifeline for lone workers in often dangerous remote settings. These are just a handful of examples of how Iridium's IoT technology supports commercial and industrial activities and we continue to invest in concert with our partners to facilitate less costly, more efficient technology and end-user solutions. This helps to support broader use of our network and adoption into new industries. For example, we're developing a new cloud-native, IP-centric data module called the Iridium 9704 that will be ready next year and that is even more efficient and cost-effective at moving IoT data across our network. It will be even easier for existing and new partners to develop their applications with this new module. It will utilize our Iridium Certus technology platform for faster data, data transport and quicker connections. And it's the kind of product our partners are telling us they are really excited about for their own IoT applications and the new solutions they want to invest in. It will add new functionality in a very small form factor and continue to support our IoT growth well into the future. Thanks to investments like these and our global network, we remain very successful with mainstream consumer products using our IoT technology, like mobile personal satellite communicators. This market alone has driven compounded annual revenue growth of greater than 50% for us since 2017. Personal satellite communications has driven significant subscriber growth for us, and we expect it to remain a strong avenue for growth in the coming years 
even as smartphones start making connections to our satellites. Today, personal satellite communication devices account for about 740,000 of the short burst IoT connections on our network, and we continue to see strong demand in this area. In terms of higher speed connections, the launch of our mid-band technology, something our partners know as Iridium Certus 100 services, is bringing greater functionality to our commercial customers, and we are in the early days of our partners taking advantage of these services and driving growth. Higher throughput, up to almost 100 kilobits per second, supports higher ARPU services like feature-rich messaging, image transmission, and even real-time video. Importantly, the modules and antennas we've developed for these services are very small and lightweight, so subscribers can leverage this functionality on the go. And there's a wide funnel of use cases, from autonomous assets and aerial vehicles like helicopters and unmanned aerial vehicles, to commercial and recreational sensors and even consumer devices. The low power usage of these battery-powered mobile devices is what makes them so appealing. They have unique utility to mobile users, which is why Iridium's name and network remain the standard for any discussion of satellite mobility applications. We look forward to sharing more about the adoption of Iridium's mid-band technology and plan to do a deeper dive on all of our services, industry penetration, and market adoption when we host our next Investor Day in mid-2023. The day will allow us to put all these opportunities for growth into perspective and focus on what they mean for our future and for continued shareholder value creation. More on this to come from uh, Ken as we plan for 2023. So an update on our business would not be complete without commenting on Iridium's broadband success, so let me touch on our progress there. As you know, Iridium's L-band services are used in maritime as standalone and paired with VSAT for companion services. The introduction of our lower-cost Iridium Certus 200 service last year now complements our flagship Iridium Certus 700 service and has only deepened our penetration of the maritime market. In 2022, we have seen an acceleration in sales for both these broadband classes and expect that new terminals from our VAM partners will drive incremental growth. It's a strong statement that our broadband revenue grew by 19% this quarter from the year-ago period. So we're performing well and believe Iridium Connected Solutions now continue to take market share and make up the majority of new maritime business for L-band satellite connectivity. We also continue to work with a number of partners who are launching their respective Iridium Certus broadband products in the aviation sector. Some are already seeing success. For example, Skytrack's new product that is finalizing certification has already been adopted by the French Armed Services for Helicopter Service. With the antenna certification activities we have underway now, I expect you'll be hearing from additional partners as their products come to market over the next few months. Before I turn the call over to Tom, just a, uh, some more comments on a few other fac facets of our business. Uh, Arion's business has had strong revenue growth this year from its customers as air travel recovers. They are at early stages with investment into new data products and services that mine their unique global data set and we look forward to their continued business development in that area. Uh, you might notice that our engineering and support revenue is accelerating. That's been driven by our continued strong relationship with the U.S. government. <clears throat> We're already doing more R&D and specialized support projects for the government prior to this year's big award of an operations and maintenance contract for the Space Development Agency's new LEO network. That project has gotten off to a very fast start and is going well. We expect our business with them will continue to expand beyond the $133 million base contract as we execute on the plan and find ways to help the SDA in even more areas over the coming years. Beyond the SDA, you may have seen news of our field exercises with the U.S. government and others in the Indo-Pacific region during the third quarter. This series of demonstration, called Operation Pacific Waves, involved more than 20 of our partners in collaboration with the U.S. and its allies around the region. It was a big success and should lead to deeper relationships and broader adoption of solutions across our commercial and government platforms. So, uh, Iridium continues to occupy a unique lane, even among satellite companies, and today that lane is characterized by strong demand and numerous growth opportunities. We're benefiting from current industry trends for mobility and remote connectivity. We have all of our oars in the water and are excited about new product launches and their ability to expand our geographic reach and relevance to a growing number of people. 
We believe that this year's results will surpass our initial estimates and we have good visibility into demand for 2023. The vectors for the five-year growth plan we shared with you a few years ago remain intact and we continue to be on track to generate at least $2 billion of free cash flow by 2025 since the new constellation deployed. We look forward to updating you on future projections and growth vectors at the Investor Day we're planning for next year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tom for a review of our financials. Tom? Thanks, Matt, and good morning, everyone. I'll get started by summarizing our key financial metrics for the quarter and providing some color on the trends we're seeing in our business lines. I'll then review our full-year guidance, liquidity position, and capital structure. Iridium continued to execute well in the current uncertain macroeconomic environment. We generated total revenue of $184.1 million in the third quarter, which was up 14% from last year's comparable quarter. The improvement reflected ongoing strength in our commercial business lines, growing engineering work supported by the SDA contract, and continued strong demand for subscriber equipment. Operational EBITDA was $107.8 million in the third quarter, up 8% from the prior year's quarter. Strong fundamentals and ongoing momentum in our business give us confidence in increasing our full-year outlook for service revenue growth to between 8 and 9% and delivering EBITDA of approximately $420 million this year. On the commercial side of our business, service revenue was up 10% this quarter to $112.5 million. This increase was supported by growth across all business lines. Commercial voice and data revenue grew by 10% in the third quarter to $50.3 million. As we noted last quarter, our Push to Talk and Iridium Go offerings are experiencing robust growth. Additionally, we are seeing increased demand due to the lack of available handsets from our competitors. These factors lead us to believe that our voice and data business will grow at a mid-single-digit rate, on average, for at least the next several years up from the low single-digit rate, which had previously been the norm. In commercial IoT, revenue grew 12% from the prior year quarter to $33.8 million in the third quarter. We continue to benefit from strong demand for our personal communication services. Year over year, commercial IoT subs grew 22%, with a record 89,000 net activations during the third quarter alone. IoT ARPU was $8.24 in the quarter, compared to $8.93 in the prior year period. The decrease in ARPU from the year-ago period was caused primarily by the shifting mix of subscribers using lower ARPU plans, largely attributable to the increasing proportion of personal communication subscribers. These subscribers use less data and so have lower ARPU than other IoT subscribers. We continue to view IoT, and specifically the personal communication sector, as an attractive market opportunity, even with the advent of direct-to-smartphone satellite communications. Iridium maintains a leadership position in IoT for mobile assets. As Matt described, our network is being used broadly for mission-critical applications by commercial and industrial subscribers. The devices that our partners design and manufacture are purpose-built, meaning they are rugged, weather-resistant, engineered with long battery lives, and meant to remain in the field without maintenance for years. These consumer-oriented devices are purpose-built with specific software, applications, durability, and battery life in mind that addresses the needs of end users. Today, about 50% of our commercial IoT users are personal communication subscribers. This population of users remain a very attractive contributor to our service revenue growth in light of the minimal comparative network resources they consume. In total, IoT subscribers now represent 77% of Iridium's billable commercial subscribers, up from 75% in the year-ago period. Commercial broadband revenue rose 19% from the prior year quarter to $13.6 million in the third quarter. Activations continue to be driven by the adoption of Iridium service terminals and maritime. Iridium service is increasingly being paired as a companion to VSAT terminals and is also being installed as an upgrade to our legacy Iridium open port service. Hosting and other data services revenue was $14.8 million this quarter, consistent with the prior year quarter. 
Turning to our government service business, we reported revenue of $26.5 million in the third quarter, up 2% from $25.9 million in the prior year quarter. This increase reflects the contractual terms of our long-term ESS, EMSS contract. Subscriber equipment continued to benefit from strong demand, rising 4% from the prior year period to $28 million. Based upon the backlog and order volume we have received, we believe that equipment sales this year will come in well above 2021's level. As I noted previously, equipment margin as a percent of revenue is expected to decline this year to around 35%, driven by higher component costs and product mix. Engineering and support revenue was $17.1 million in the third quarter as compared to $7.5 million <clears throat> in the year-ago period. We have reached a new level of ongoing engineering work with recent contract wins from the U.S. government, much of this coming from the award of the Space Development Agency contract earlier this year. This contract is highly strategic and aligns Iridium with the U.S. government's long-term space priorities. While contract work from the U.S. government tends to be episodic, we expect Iridium's engineering and support revenue will rise this year from 2021's level and remain higher going forward. Through the first nine months of the year, we've been very happy with our performance and the ongoing growth we've realized as a result of demand for our equipment and services. These trends support a revised outlook for service revenue growth and give us confidence in raising our full year guidance for operational EBITDA. We also expect to exit this year with 2 million subscribers, a figure that amounts to a doubling of our subscriber base in just four years. We expect to be able to reach 3 million subscribers even faster. I would remind our investors of our expectations for operational EBITDA margin percentage to be below 60% for 2022. This level of margin percentage is driven by materially higher equipment and engineering and support revenues this year. Those revenues are accretive to EBITDA margin dollars, but dilutive to EBITDA margin percentages. As Matt noted, we expect work under the SDA contract to generate low margins, which we view as acceptable given its strategic importance. Moving to our capital position as of September 30th of 2022, Iridium had a cash and cash equivalents balance of approximately $219 million. In the third quarter, Iridium purchased approximately 1.8 million shares of common stock at a total purchase price of $80.2 million. Since the original authorization of our buyback program in 2021, we have retired close to 11 million shares at a total purchase price of about $413 million, or $37.63 per share. We will continue to be disciplined in executing on our authorization. Net leverage was 3.4 times OEBITDA at the end of the third quarter. This was down from 3.6 times a year earlier and includes the impact of our ongoing buyback activity. Our long-term target for net leverage continues to be between 2.5 and 3.5 times OEBITDA at the end of 2023. We expect to be within this target range even after giving effect to all share buybacks authorized by our board. Capital expenditures in the third quarter were $13.7 million and included spending related to next year's launch of up to five ground spare satellites. You will recall that this launch of our ground spares is a one-time event which we now expect will cost us between $35 and $40 million and be incurred this year and next. We anticipate that the launch will take place in mid-2023. We expect CapEx, including launch costs in 2022, will not exceed $75 million. Let me remind you how we calculate free cash flow. We use our 2022 EBITDA guidance and back off $67 million in net interest for our current debt structure, approximately $75 million in CapEx for this year, and $14 million in working capital, inclusive of the appropriate hosted payload adjustment, we're projecting pro forma free cash flow of approximately $264 million. These metrics represent a conversion rate of EBITDA to free cash flow of 63% in 2022 and a yield approaching 5%. And, of course, we've hedged the term loan and believe this positions us to, well to weather the current interest rate environment. A more detailed description of these cash flow metrics, along with the reconciliation to gap measures, is available in a supplemental presentation 
under Events on our Investor Relations website. With only a few months left in the year, we're very excited about Iridium's business prospects and the strong competitive position we maintain in our industry. We continue to work with partners to develop new products and believe that these will provide us with momentum and drive revenue and EBITDA growth. This positions us very well as we look into 2023 and beyond. With that, I'll turn things back to the operator for the Q&A. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. The first question is from Rick Prentice of Raymond James. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Rick. Hey, Rick. Hey. Um, Matt, I know you mentioned uh, smartphone satellites uh, will become clearer in due time, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a couple of questions around it. Um, I think previously, a few months ago, you mentioned that you're working on the service agreement with the unnamed technology development uh, partner. Can you update us as far as timeline, as far as when you expect to have that service agreement um, in place? Um, I think I, I think I previously said we expected it to happen before the end of the year, and I think we're still on that, certainly on that track right now. Um, and uh, uh, sorry, I would love to talk more about that subject. You know, as I said, we're very well positioned in that area and excited about our our plans, but it really isn't. Uh, it really would be a uh, it really is more for an announcement for our partners to make and uh, and those who are really more directly involved in here. So um, it will come in due time. Makes sense. Just want to make sure the service agreement was still on track for end of year. Um, how should we think about the potential impact that might have then on your capacity of your existing satellite constellation or the timeline as far as how long this capital holiday might last? Uh, how should we think about both those items and what they might mean? Obviously, people have seen the Apple Global Star announcement, and they want to consume a large amount of capacity on, on, on those birds. Just trying to think what this might mean from a capacity and life of satellite standpoint. Yeah, so, I mean, our network is, I mean, was built um, and, and designed and architected really to be extremely efficient at sending um, information around all over the all over the planet, and we're uh, we've done our estimations of and expectations of at least you know what we can see so far, and we think we have uh, you know plenty of capacity to support the services that we're expecting using our existing network uh, and existing spectrum. So our plans are it doesn't really change our expectations on the capital holiday time frame. We don't need to invest in another network, um, you know, and uh, uh, kind of excited about the potential upside it, it, it brings to our plans right now, uh, which really really aren't in our plans today. Okay, so the capital holiday is still thinking that it can last through most of uh, maybe this decade? Yeah, I mean, we, we've always said there's at least a 10-year CapEx holiday, and we're still on that track. Okay, um, and I think previous calls you've also mentioned Spectrum, you might be interested. Uh, is there other Spectrum out there? something beside the L-band, or is it just finding more L-band, and maybe just an update uh, on what's happening with the Legato situation? Yeah, so, uh, you know, um, I think it's only been in the last year or two, probably through all these um, discussions around um, direct-to-smartphone capability, that everybody sun suddenly woke up and realized that the L-band and our neighbor next to it, the S-band, are probably the most ideal spectrum for that kind of connectivity for, for small, portable, consumer-type products of any sort. I think we're seeing that right now in the narrowband IoT sector where people were thinking about other spectrum like even UHF and VHF, but they realized none of those are as, uh, as good as L-band and S-band for that. And there are a couple of us with L-band and S-band. Um, we're one of the few complete networks right now um, that has gone up and is able to uh, provide services uh, to those types of devices and is ready and ready to go with, with uh, very little kind of effort to do that. Um, others would have to build whole whole new networks potentially to support it. Um, you've seen the 
announcement with Apple and Global Star, there's a fair amount of investment that even has to happen there since uh, Global Star's uh, network was getting a little long in the tooth. Um, so they have to invest in that as well to, to maintain and support and, and grow that. We don't have that same situation, so we're in a we're in a great environment, really, to make this an incremental activity on top of what we're doing. Um, and as far as far as Legato goes, I mean, I think uh, as we reported uh, previously, you know, I think the last real uh, kind of news there was the National Academy of Sciences report, which was, as we expected, you know, described that uh, Legato would be an ir interfere to us and to GPS and uh, and that certainly um, uh, has sort of changed the focus. I think uh, Legato announced that they were sort of terminating their activity for their demonstration system that they were planning uh, and are in negotiations, which I, I take as a positive sign that uh, things won't be moving forward anytime soon on that front. So um, that, that's certainly consistent with what we believe should happen there anyway, and believe that the FCC should never have really allowed that satellite spectrum to be to be reused so closely to important um, global satellite services. Great. Thanks for the update. Looking forward to see you guys in December, and then for the analyst day sometime in mid-23. Okay. Thanks, Great. Rick. Thanks, Rick. The next question is from Landon Park of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, I was wondering if we could start on the service, uh, service aviation side. You know, just given that those products are finally um, coming to market now, can you maybe just remind us of your expectations there over the next couple of years in terms of what the TAM looks like and what, what kind of ARPUs you're expecting on those devices? Yeah, so um, the expectations would be, um, you know, our our sweet spot is going to be the aviation safety part of the market, um, uh, as well as I'd say the, the smaller platforms using, say, Certus 100 and 200 technology, and to some extent, um, you know, the safety side of the commercial aviation world, the cockpit um, communications and data. Uh, transfer to commercial airlines, particularly on long haul flights. Um, it's a there's a lot of excitement. We got a lot of partners working at front. They, um, in some ways, our network is suitable is more suitable for a lot of applications that other networks aren't. You know, particularly things like uh, rotorcraft of all types. I was just visiting. Um, if you follow me on Twitter. Uh, you know, medevac helicopter company, and it's, re it's real clear, you know, globally, uh, we're just one of the few things that really work well uh, on, on something like a helicopter or these days a UAV, um, uh, which uh, is, is a very early stage market. Um, a lot of areas are um, focused on smaller platforms, so Certus 100 and Certus 200 are going to be very um, well used on those. The ARPUs are, are quite attractive. They're um, certainly above where they are today in, in voice and data services. Um, hard to say exactly what they're going to be because they're going to be a broad range from uh, you know, UAVs, which could be quite high in some applications. Um, some of the monitored rotorcraft, et cetera, could be quite high commercial safety. Those airplanes are always in activity. But in general aviation and some other areas, it might be a little bit lower because those, those uh, um, aircraft aren't flown quite as much. But I'm just real pleased to see that these products are finally within uh, within weeks and months as opposed to uh, longer than that in, uh, in being introduced. Great. Thanks very much for that. Um, and then uh, turning to the, the government side, you know, I, I'm just wondering if you can update us on your relationship there, you know, the, the recent demonstrations in the, the Pacific and um, you, you announced the, you formally announced the new partners there. Can you talk about, you know, how you're thinking about that, TAM, and, and your ability to execute, you know, are you still thinking about it as a $100 million sort of opportunity over the longer term, or, or how do you think about it? Well, the narrowband services, of course, are, um, you know, are covered by our firm fixed price contract, and that's been, um, that's been pretty steady and still has uh, time to go and will be eventually 
eventually renegotiated. And, you know, I I think, um, you know, when I look out in the future on what that will be, hard to tell exactly where that will go. I think the value of our services, our strategic relationship with the government has only grown. You know, our impact in a number of really important programs is actually coming online. Um, I think another way of kind of looking at the relationship with the government is through the engineering and services side, and you can see that's really grown quite dramatically over the last year or two, and, and now with the SDA relationship, which is a very important network and relationship that's that's at a much higher level now and will we'll remain that way for a while. Um, I do think we're still at the early stages for CERTUS with the government, both in mid-band and in uh, broadband. You see we've signed up a number of new um, distributors now. I don't think our our uh, go-to-market strategy was optimal a couple years ago, but I think we're in a much better place now with more more companies going after more opportunities, um, and I think that will start to pay off here before long. And then, of course, uh, you know, government continues to find new ways of using our network, and we'll keep keep looking at those uh, those ways going forward. And I mean, for, on the service side, you guys have previously talked about a, you know sort of a hundred million dollar market. There is that still the right way to think about it in terms of what you can go after over time, or is there yeah, so the install. Yeah, the installed base um, of the of the government for for what we call broadband is is that hundred million dollar number, and that's just that's just a taking market share away from the incumbent. Landon, I would the way I think about it is if you look at our broadband business, uh, we put up a nineteen percent growth in the quarter. There's not much government; we haven't taken much of that hundred away, so that just that that take away uh, should be helpful in the broadband growth. You know, as we look forward. It is it is some takeaway, but it's also if you looked at Operational Pacific Ways, the kinds of applications that were being demonstrated across the board, things like UAVs and and, uh, and safety services and video, you know, real-time video in really remote places, including at the poles, at, at, south, at the South Pole and cross wide uh, ranges, those were some lots of new applications that can't be done any other way than really uh, CERTUS. So I, th I think, uh, think mid-band will be a, a unique place for, for growth there with the government. Great, that's very helpful. And just one follow-up follow on the government side. Can you help us think about how to model the engineering revenue, you know, the cadence over the next, you know, quarter or the next couple, year or two? Just, you know, how should we think about that, that 133 flowing through? Um, yeah, so it's heavy, it's heavy in the next two years, this year and next, and then it tapers. Cause it, so there's – uh, like, think of the two years as like, almost like construction, and then the last three years of the contract is the is kind of the service uh, agreement. All right. Well, really appreciate you taking the questions, guys. Sure, Landon. The next question is from Greg Burns of Fidoti and Company. Please go ahead. Good morning. Um, just a follow up on the aviation opportunity. Could you just um, remind me? Is that mainly being deployed onto new crafts, or is there a retrofit opportunity there? And could you just uh, remind me about the the size of the opportunity there, maybe relative to the the market, the the size of the market for maritime? Yeah, it, it's it's smaller than the maritime market in the near to medium term. I mean, um, we're only getting really started. We've already been in aviation for a while, and it's it's you know recognized and both voice and data and IoT revenues right now. Um, I mean, we've talked in the past about being installed in our narrowband services uh, in both safety and and just uh, and, and sort of IoT and other applications as being in the you know 30 to 40,000 aircraft around the world have been installed. So I think a lot of those um, could be upgrades, you know, to faster services with more um, more capability with higher speeds and um, and, and a more efficient way of doing that. But I think that a lot of this will be new applications, like the UAV segment is completely new to us. And uh, we've got a whole number of partners that are uh, doing work in that area, and uh, I believe that will be future opportunities. And, of course, a bit more of the broadband, low end of the broadband space. Um, you know, most solutions out there, you know, Hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars to put on a on a big aircraft. Um, that's not what we're typically talking about for 
you know, say a Certus 100 type application or, or even a Certus 200 uh, application or even, even Certus 700 are going to be much more cost competitive. And so there may be a lot of aircraft that want to be connected um, uh, that aren't connected today. So I think there will be a, a new growth market. But you're right, we haven't necessarily called out an exact TAM for the market. Um, and that's something we'll do some work on in uh, – and help you understand maybe uh, next year at this investor day, which I think we're kind of, by the way, sort of penciling in May sometime, but we'll see exactly where that, that works out to be. Okay, thanks. And then in terms of the um, cell phone connectivity, what is the the functionality that you're envisioning there versus what you're doing now in the personal communication device market with like DeLorme? Like what what is, do you, yeah, well, I mean, why do you think there won't be any like cannibalization there? Like, is there different levels of functionality? Like, I'm just trying to understand why the the cell phone connectivity won't cannibalize that core personal communication business. Yeah, well, I I think uh, I think that you're going to see at least in the next couple of years, uh, whether it be Apple or you know the approach that we take, uh, will be a bit more. Um, you know, users are, are not going to be uh, people, it's going to be unexpected sort of use around the world, emergency and remote activities that sort of you didn't plan on um, through a much larger base of devices, but it will be sort of uh, casual use occasionally. I think what we're seeing and what we hear from Garmin and all our other personal communication providers that work today is that they really have very dedicated and focused applications for recreational users, for hikers, for um, emergency workers, for um, you know maritime users, and they really focus on delivering specific things to those users who kind of need to depend on uh, a service. And it's obviously been very successful, but they're they're kind of telling us and uh, and probably been sharing a little bit more of our plans with them, obviously as partners and. They're pretty comfortable competing in that kind of environment going forward. They're not too worried about uh, our our solution or you know the kind of solution say coming from Apple uh, and others. So I, that's what that's what gives us a lot of confidence that I think I think both those markets are going to grow uh, quite nicely. Great, thank you. Sure. The next question is from Hamed Korsand of BWS Financial. Please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, so, just want to ask you as to what your expectations are on the maritime area. Um, you know, are you expecting any acceleration in subscriber growth in that area, and how are you going about as far as marketing and garnering more, uh, capturing more customers there? Well, I mean, since we introduced um, Certus uh, 700 service a couple years ago, you know, we've added terminal manufacturers, um, so, you know, we now have, uh, you know, adding Intellion was, I think, a great move, moving down into the Certus 200 market segment, which is a much lower cost device, uh, particularly in companion kind of applications or standalone applications. All those have, you know, sort of hit the market, and you can see, you know, the performance. I mean, 19% uh, growth year over year is, is pretty good growth. So we're taking market share, and I've, I believe really, for almost all non inmarsat activity out there, which are a lot of companies sell VSAT services and are looking to put uh, LBAN as a companion service with it, um, and or looking to just sell an LBAN component um, alone, are really using Iridium. I think the majority of that are really uh, are going to the market with Iridium. So um, with adding GMDSS to that has added another sort of uh, reason to buy uh, uh, Iridium, and we're working to, you know, put uh, GMDSS on Certus now, too, as well. So all those things have put us in a very good competitive market. We believe we're taking share. Uh, we're well positioned for future business in that market. It's a large market, and everybody is very happy with our service and has taken it to market, and you can see it in our results. So um, I think we're in good, good, a very good place in the maritime market right now. And my other question was to, uh, on the R&D line, is that related to what you're working on as far as, uh, you know, push to talk and maybe even smartphone or, or 
or is that a one-time, you know, um, push up in the price uh, and the expense line? Would that ever come down? Um, Tom, you want to address that at all? Or? When you say, you mean sequentially? What, what, what's your specific question, Hamid? Well, R&D R &D went up sequentially and year over year. Um, so I'm just trying to understand what what's the you know normal you know line uh, expense line for this, and what's the reason that it's all of a sudden increasing. So you know, just our install base of products modernization. So uh, I, I, we do expect R and D to be up year over year, um, but it's not not materially. So it's probably you know. Five million bucks or something like that will be up, and, that, and that's just investment in our in our uh, modernization of our product line. Yeah, and I mean, as we've gotten larger, I mean, we're just it's a target rich environment for things to work on. In fact, it's you know, we have to. Uh, there, there's so many things we want to do, and in fact, you know, I think you're going to see the results of a lot of our R&D coming over the next 12 months. Um, you know, through the activities that we've been spending it on. So, uh, it's really broad based. You know, we're really working across a whole number of areas uh, in uh, IoT, in voice and data, in broadband, in, um, um, in, in really retooling our network in many ways um, for even greater efficiency. So um, it's just a recognition of the opportunities we have. Okay, great. Thank you. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star then one. The next question is from Matthew Robillard of Barclays. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking the questions. I had two, please. The first one is regards to Starlink. So obviously we see them moving to lots of different verticals, and I realize the vast majority are not areas where you compete. But um, some time ago, they, they did buy a small... Leo IoT Constellation, so I suspect there's uh, some ambitions there, and I, I don't know if you think that that could represent a competitive threat at some point. And the second one was back to uh, to, 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 to the project for handset connectivity, and I just wanted to clarify um, that this service was being considered for, for using L-band, and, and whether you had all the uh, necessary uh, regulatory uh, approvals to, to use that service um, with L-Band, and, and how should we think about <clears throat> when and how L-Band could be included in some of the chipset? Is that, is that something you you are also working on? Is that more uh, something that would fall on your partners? Thank you. Uh, yes, so, you know, the first question was about Starlink uh, and are they a competitor, and we still don't see you know, really them in the in the market or believe that they're going to be a major competitor. I think you were referring to their acquisition of Swarm, which was a, one of the 30 or so narrowband IoT networks that were announced. And I said in my prepared remarks, I really think that there's not going to be very many of those in the end that are probably going to survive, but they, there will be some, and we're very interested in that area and potentially could get into that market. So to the extent we're both going after what I would call non-real-time, low-end, extremely low-power IoT, either using sort of standardized 5G sort of technology coming or or proprietary technology like Swarm, um, we, would, uh, we would sort of see them in the market, I guess. But, I mean, we're such big players right now in IoT, IoT with so many solutions and partnerships around the world. We have such a natural advantage there to kind of add that into our portfolio. We think we'll will do very well, but the IoT market is huge, I think, long term, and so, you know, we may see them in the market, but I just don't think I would call them a major competitor to us. This will be around the fringe of our us right now. Um, you know, and, and also their activities right now, I think that goes into your second question. Their announced activities so far with T-Mobile were really around not using L-band spectrum. It was using terrestrial uh, spectrum that is used, uh, the T-Mobile's uh, I think AWS spectrum in the U.S. and probably other spectrum around the world if it happens. Doing that, as you kind of imply, requires a lot of both technical development to go on, uh, but more importantly, a lot of regulatory work too. A lot of approvals still have to go on around the world.
for using terrestrial spectrum because, you know, you are basically using spectrum where it hasn't been approved and where it may interfere with other services. So there's a lot of coordination and regulatory approvals, market by market, country by country, uh, with a lot of business agreements to kind of make that sort of activity happen. The better way, the more immediate way to connect smartphones from space is to use L or S band today, or L, you know, uh, maybe more S band is the Apple uh, Global Star way. Our approach would be to use L band, and uh, that exists. Uh, as you said, there is no regulatory requirements. We already have global uh, global license to operate uh, from satellites to any small device on the ground, including a smartphone. There's no approvals required nor more landing rights that we don't have today. So really, it's just a matter of adding that capability. I will, I will won't say any more about how we add it because I think that's what we've uh, left to the the announcement in future, or who we're adding it with, or how that will go to market. Uh, but I think most people can probably get a rough idea how that works. So, does that help, Matthew? Yes, that, that's very clear. I guess uh, the, the, the question on, you know, L-band not at the moment, not being at the moment something that is embedded in, in your traditional smartphone, um, but, and how, how how that could be sort of, I guess, what you're implying is that it, it's maybe something for your partner to, to deal with rather than you directly. Yes, if I if I told you that, I would be giving your plans away. But I mean, I think you can kind of see. Uh, obviously, Apple embedded, you know, Global Star's technology into their iPhone 14. Um, that certainly has been the way that they have made a direct connection from space to satellite, and doesn't require, as you can see, they've they've announced that that initial service will be operating in North America alone. Um, you know. It's not for regulatory purposes or anything. It's really probably more for technical reasons and what, where the service can be deployed uh, or where they want to deploy the service. You know, we would be focused on delivering global services, whatever we do, and uh, obviously our L-band has to go into a device. That's very clear. Thank you, Matthew. Okay. Thank you. Our final question comes from Louis De Palma with William Blair. Please go ahead. Matt, Tom, and Ken, good morning. Hey, Louis. Hey, Louis. Matt, um, following up on your recent answer to the cannibalization question, do you expect for smartphone satellite connectivity to entail some casual use beyond emergency use, for instance, could a smartphone send 10 satellite texts a year, as you obviously wouldn't expect someone to have 10 emergencies in a year unless that person were very, very accident prone, whereas Garmin and Zolio devices on your network perhaps send 100 messages a year or 500 messages, including GPS pings for hardcore um, campers and, and hikers. So how do you, uh, in terms of usage, what are your expectations? Well, that's a great question, Louis, and gets into, you know, almost specifically um, a clever way of trying to get me to tell you exactly what our service will do and how it will work. Um, you know, I, I think you're, you're kind of uh, uh, moving off of sort of the Apple announcement, which, um, you know, we tracked as well. Obviously, if you if you make a connection to a smartphone, you can do a lot more than just push an emergency button. Um, I won't go into exactly how and what more you can do, but our network is very efficient at sending information back and forth, so lots of, lots could be done. And by the way, not just with smartphones. I mean, our really long-term future is to be connected in other types of consumer devices. Um, you know, maybe tablets, watches. Uh, you know, vehicles, um, cars. You know, maybe long term, uh, as not not for everyday use, but as a as a complement to other technologies that are are going into uh, those vehicles. So, and if you have a messaging platform that can go back and forth, I can assure you, you can think of all kinds of things to do. But I mean, coming back to the, you know, I, I don't even, I really 
believe strongly that there's not going to be considerable uh, cannibalization. I mean, we really do see, based upon um, really more discussions with our partners around that base, is it's just it's going to be, I think, multiple product classes that are going to exist. Maybe around the edges it would be, but I think it's going to be very much additive to our business and anybody's business that does this. Um, is it going to be, I've seen some people out there forecasting that the direct-to-smartphone market could be tens of billions of dollars. I'm, as you could probably see in the Wall Street Journal article last week, I'm a little skeptical about that because that is, that's really implying a high-speed, seamless, works in your pocket anywhere on the planet kind of activity. And um, I think that's many, many years away, if ever, because of just the investment that would require in networks to do that. It would require completely different systems in space. Um, it would require a lot of regulatory work on the ground. It will require a lot of work in terms of standardization, and that's not what really I think is going to be the way uh, these services roll out in the next couple of years and what you're going to see. So I really think you're going to see very complementary services in the, and I'd say near term, meaning the next three, five, seven years or so, particularly. Um, what's beyond that? Who knows? You know, there's a lot of innovation and investment that could occur, but I think they're quite a far ways out. Great. And um, I think you added 89,000 quarterly net ads for IoT, which appears to be the highest level or highest number that you've ever added. And, and Garmin recently announced a new in-reach messenger device. Are there more consumer devices expected over the next several months that could allow that like very high cadence of IoT net ads to continue? Or should we accept or should we expect like a tapering of those those net ads? I, I don't think you I don't think what you saw this quarter is unusual. I mean it's just uh it's a new high water mark for us. But at, you know, just based on what you can see in terms of equipment supply right now. Uh, we're at a much higher level, and we're really seeing really strong demand going into next year already, too. So uh, I would be surprised if, if those really kind of high numbers, especially as new products like that Messenger looks great and other products come to market. Um, I, I, I just think you're going to continue to see really good demand in that sector. Yeah, I mean, as, as I said in my remarks, Louis, we, we expect to get to 3 million subscribers in less time than it took us to get to 2. Great. And Tom, one for you. Um, last quarter, I believe you added additional investment into Arion. Are you able to say whether Arion is um, free cash flow break even or or, and, or free cash flow positive? And like, would they need more um, equity funding over the next year or two? They're cash flow positive, and we don't expect more investment unless there's an opportunity that presents itself, certainly not just to kind of pay their bills. Great. And um, on on Arion, can you provide just a high-level target? I know you've announced that, or Arion has announced that the, um, the FAA had a successful trial of their services in the Caribbean, um, what's the the timeline for a greater expansion or integration of the Arion services um, into the FAA? You know, I I don't. It, uh, our expectations from you know the interactions we've had with them is that that's still quite a few years away. Um, they are they're just very slow, you know, and I think um, perhaps the lack of leadership at the FAA lacking administrator, lots of other activities they have underway right now. I uh, don't know why that um, Don is signing contracts with Azerbaijan this week and, you know, it's not, not deploying uh, services uh, with the FAA yet. So I think that's still out in the future, um, not in the near term, because they just have a lot of work apparently to do and decisions to make and other things to decide if that's, uh, if and when that's going to happen. So. Uh, they're still out in the future, but you know there's still a lot of other uh, markets they have they don't serve yet. So I think they're they're busy um, with other business development around the world, with other 
other services they're deploying. Of course, they're busy in these data products now and um, quite enthusiastic about the market for sort of exploiting their their uh, their data set. So, um, but yeah, I don't I don't have an update on the FAA in terms of when when and if they'll um, they'll be deploying in a big way. It's certainly a few quite a few years out, I think, still. Great. Thanks, Matt, Tom, and, and Ken. And looking forward to perhaps taking the trip to Tyson's Corner in, in May. Yeah, well, you know, we'll figure out where we're going to even have that. I guess we could have it here. Um, we'll, we'll figure out a good place to have that as well here. But I think uh, just wanted to give you kind of a heads up on when we'll put together and kind of have a reset on, on the future business. Awesome. Thanks. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to management for closing remarks. Well, thanks. Um, you know, I, guess, I guess you can tell we're quite optimistic about not just this year, but you know, our, our business going forward, and our and our enthusiastic about really putting it all together uh, so that you can see sort of a longer term view, even um, when we get together in the second quarter of next year. But um, uh, look forward to continuing to talk to all of you, and uh, we'll see you after the fourth quarter. Thank you. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.